Hello, everyone. Welcome to the FTX podcast. I'm very glad to have here with me today, Alex Mashinsky, the founder of Celsius. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure, Alex. It's good to chat. I know we've been talking with your team about making this happen for a little bit, so we made it happen. To get things started here, would you mind introducing yourself to those that may not know you? Sure. Um, so again, Alex Mashinsky, I'm the co-founder of Celsius Network. It's my eighth startup as a founder, so I've done this a few times. And uh, Celsius is uh, my third unicorn. So, um, you know, most people think of, when you tell them unicorn, they think of uh, Uniswap. But uh, in, the, in the tech world, it's a, a creating a company that's worth over a billion dollars. So, so it's definitely um, uh, a trifecta here. Wonderful. And would you... Would you tell me a little bit more about some of these previous endeavors that you went with before cryptocurrency? Sure, yeah. So so I came to the US as, a, as an immigrant, actually right at the birth of the internet in the late 80s. And uh, got to, I was lucky that I got to work on uh, uh, Voice over IP. So I wrote the original patent uh, for Voice over IP and built the f- world's first gateway back in 1994. Uh, we use VoIP right now in this call, and uh, basically more than half of the people on the planet now communicating the, using this technology. So, uh, so it helps to be early. It has, helps to be in the right place at the right time. Uh, so that's kind of like, uh, uh, I thought I was famous for that, but then I said no to Sergey Brin when he was looking for his first check uh, to start <laughs> Google. And, and, and I said, who needs another search engine? So... We have Alta Vista and Lycos and so on. So now I'm really famous for the guy who said no to Sergey Brin, really, at least in, in the Silicon Valley. Uh, uh, but after that, I, I did several other companies. So like uh, Uber, before Uber, a company called Groundlink, um, uh, Transit Wireless, which is a company that runs all the 5G and Wi-Fi in the subways, in the New York subways. So we provide the, all that service to 8 million people. It used to be 8 million people every day. Now during Corona, I think it's like half a million people every day. Yeah. Um, so all mostly companies that dealt with infrastructure or tech or technology. And uh, really I tried to get into FinTech. I tried to, like I tried to create electronic money by attaching it to email back in 2003. Mm-hmm. and got a call from the feds and they basically said, look, this is not a good idea. If you continue with this, we're going to have to bring you in. Uh, <laughs> so when I saw Satoshi's paper, um, first I thought it was like really just very inefficient and slow system because everything I've built uh, was uh, cheaper, faster, and better. Like for example, uh, before Celsius, I was CEO of Novatil Wireless. It's a public company with mm-hmm. 1,500 employees, and we launched the first 5G device in the United States uh, for Verizon, the MiFi 1000. Um, and so it's faster, it's better, it's cheaper, right? So, so everything I've did in my entire career. So it was very hard for me to kind of look at a database that was running at one millionth the speed of, of traditional databases and think of it as an advancement of moving forward. So, uh, but then I, it, it finally, I finally fell down the rabbit hole and realized that it's not about efficiency, it's about solving the double spend issue. And uh, then I was hooked. So that's kind of like my migration into crypto, you know, so. And, and, I'm assuming you didn't start working within crypto right away when you when you discover the white paper, right? There was a, a transition or a period for you? Well, so first I was a denier. I was one of those guys that you see who were, it's horrible, it's never going to work, it's not going to scale. And to mine the last Bitcoin, they're not enough, uh, basically there's not enough electricity on the entire planet to mine the last Bitcoin, right? If you mm-hmm. do the math of, of the progression of the difficulty, um, so it just looked like very inefficient way to, to get to the result uh, of, of basically creating a distributed ledger. And so I, but after Mt. Gox, I really realized that I have to rethink 
uh, my assumptions because any traditional market where 90% of the trading happens on one exchange and suddenly that exchange gets hacked and uh, everybody loses their money, that would have been a catastrophic event. You, no, no industry can recover from that. And here, Bitcoin just gets up, you know, goes like, uh, it just keeps walking like nothing happened. I was like, wow, this is unbelievable. So I started buying some coins. I invested and advised a few projects. And then 2015, I realized, okay, it's all going to be about yield. And uh, that's when like 2016, we actually launched the company and, you know, wrote the white paper and, and basically focused on yield generation, which is what Celsius is obviously famous for creating. And what would you say, so when, when 2016 came about and you realized you wanted to enter the industry and it was time to build perhaps another unicorn and you were looking at all of this, were you doing it from the same perspective that you had done your previous businesses as in the same role or were you, so, so sorry, I guess to, to, to preface that, was your role previously as the tech person within these companies as the organizer, as what, where was your play in this? Yeah, so, so I've always been a founder. I, I, I was CEO of all of these companies, at least for the first few years. And so it wasn't any change in my role though. The big change was that uh, with Celsius, we decided to build it with the community. So my first seven companies, they were all VC backed. Mm -hmm. So I raised money from venture capital, uh, Silicon Valley or the or the East Coast and, and uh, raised over a billion dollars, right, for these companies. And, and so here I was thinking about, well, should I go to the VC route? And I was like, no, this is all about the community. If I create yield and I allow the community to come in and invest in it, right, uh, they're going to be my, my core customers and they're going to be helping us uh, basically scale and promote the project. So we we did an initial coin offering back in 2017. And then we did another round where we brought in over 1,000 of our users to actually participate on the equity side with Celsius. So, so all of my customers are also sitting with me on the bus, both as uh, uh, users, as uh, shareholders, and as depositors that are earning interest. So we all, all of our interests are aligned, which is obviously not the case when you take money from VCs or when you kind of design a traditional uh, company that is uh, that has rounds of funding and has stakeholders and a board and everything else. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And how would you describe Celsius Network? When it is is Celsius Network when it started the same product that you're offering today, or have you had some some monumental shifts there? Yeah. So so most companies go through several pivots, right? The, uh, uh, it's always funny to look at uh, their original presentation and look at what they do today. And, but if you read our white paper from 2017, it's uh, listed on our website. If you go to coingecko.com uh, or uh, Coin uh, uh, Market Cap, uh, they have links to the white paper, and you can see that our business model has not changed one inch. Uh, and again. You know, sometimes again, being at the right place at the right time, like I got lucky with VoIP. And uh, here I get lucky that uh, we launched this thing and the rates that the government and the banks pay you crash by 90%. So, so people that used to make two or 3% um, putting money in the bank suddenly are earning 0.3%. And suddenly we are paying yields that are 10, 20 times higher so that's obviously is a very big incentive for people to move their money from the fiat world to the crypto world. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that actually touches on something I was going to ask you is if you had the foresight that this was going to happen with interest rates across the board, because it seems like it's been a huge aid to your company and any lending company within crypto itself, because <laughs> who wants to keep money in the bank anymore? It doesn't make any sense. Um, Alex, for those that may not know Celsius Network, how do you describe it when you speak to people? Yeah, so a lot of people call us a lending platform, but really 90% uh, of our business is interest income. So I, I, I don't, I think we, we are not really doing uh, much lending to the depositors. I mean, we've paid 
over $250 million worth of interest to our customers, uh, over 350,000 customers all over the world. So that's uh, five times more than our nearest competitor, right? As far as like actual payout to the user community. And that's all that matters, right? What matters is that, uh, again, we, we wanted to change lives. We wanted to bring the next 100 million people into crypto. And we thought that, okay, the first kind of killer app or use case was store of value on Bitcoin. Uh, the second killer app was a smart contract on Ethereum. And, and we thought that the best uh, third killer app is uh, effectively yield, the ability to create yield. And again, we started paying interest on, on these assets a year or two before Compound or Aave or all the people that you're familiar with on DeFi uh, they basically just copied the model and, and tried to do it in a decentralized way. But uh, Celsius still pays the highest uh, rates on most of the assets. And obviously, more than half of our assets are not running on Ethereum. So we support 45 different ways of earning yield, including on Bitcoin and on Litecoin and on uh, XRP and all kinds of other assets that are not natively running on the Ethereum platform or don't participate in the DeFi farming craze that uh, we're going through right now. Perfect. Yeah. And, and I know that you guys have had a lot of growth lately. I've seen it from the communities as well as Twitter and different aspects like that. And I know a lot of it has just been mobile app driven as well. So I'd love to hear a little bit of the flow is that a user can deposit funds or crypto and then choose an asset that they want to lend and basically they'll get whatever the fair market rate for that asset is at the moment. Is that correct? Yeah, so we are launching a web app. Uh, so it's already avail available in beta and in, in uh, February, it's gonna be available to the general public. Uh, but uh, most of our users just download the app from the app store or, or the Google store. And uh, you, you have to do KYC with Celsius, we, we mm -hmm. need to, uh, send you a 1099 at the end of the year, telling you how much you earned. Uh, uh, but basically, again, you <clears throat> after you do KYC, you can deposit any of the 45 assets we support. So we support, I think, 13 different blockchains, and the rest are mostly tokens, stable coins, uh, tokenized gold, and, uh, uh, assets that are that you can stake and earn yield. Uh, or basically uh, assets that just earn yield uh, because we lend them out. And uh, we publish a rate that is a weekly rate, mm -hmm. and that rate does not change. So uh, you, you're probably familiar with how volatile these rates are on uh, DeFi projects. But what Celsius has done is because we lend to four different uh, uh, customer bases, right? We lend to institutions, we lend to exchanges, we lend to retail and we lend to DeFi. So we blend all those rates together and because of the blending, we have a very stable rate. Uh, and we pay 80% of what we collect to the customer. So, mm -hmm. so if you come in and you see that the rate on Bitcoin, like right now the rate is 6.2%, you know that we're earning something like 7.5% that's why we're paying 62 And every week that rate either goes up or down based on what the average yield is for those four different uh, uh, sources of income. Mm -hmm. So if there are suddenly wrap Bitcoin is earning a lot of yield on DeFi, that may push the rate, the average rate that we publish up the next week, right? Because we've earned more and now we're going to pay more because every week we're paying based on what we earned the week before. So we already know what we earned. We just move the rate up or down. And uh, so that's been the model from day one. And we turn the worst day of the week, Monday, into the best day of the week because you wake up and there's new money showing up in your account. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to farm. You don't have to move stuff around. You don't have to pay gas fees. Uh, and, and again, if you look at the rates we publish, um, you know, the big advantage is really that uh, you can see that we're giving you 80% or up to 80% of, of what we earn. And many times, if you have to do it yourself, you end up with less than 50% if you include the gas fees and the bid ask. Like if you go on Compound and you look at the bid ask, you will see that you're only getting half of the, whatever they're lending it out, you can see the rate that they're lending it out. You mm -hmm. can see the rate you're collecting. 
you're getting less than half. Sometimes you're getting maybe 25% of what they publish as the borrow rate. So that never happens with Celsius because we have enough institutions and other borrowers. So we have a much better balance between the depositors and the borrowers. And today we're managing over $6 billion. So we're second asset manager, only, only Grayscale is bigger than us. And uh, last year in, in January, we had uh, 500 million in assets. I was just watching a video from January. I was like, what? <laughs> Wait, you know, it kind of like finally dawned on me that we grew over 10X in one year. Uh, so definitely the community loves the product. We have a very active and, and um, devoted community. Uh, we've, you know, like I said, created a lot of value for them. And, and uh, I'm, I'm the largest user of Celsius. I have $200 million of my own money <laughs> on the <laughs> platform. So, so uh, you know, like I said, all of my customers are just sitting next to me on the bus. We're, we're enjoying the ride together, you know? Yeah, I mean, and, and I think it's just such a good time for it to give people the ability to actually earn some interest on their money right now, especially with the macro environment and everything. I think it doesn't surprise me that much you've had the growth you've had. And I think actually growth will continue as long as these trends continue on the same paths. A, a question for you, Alex, I'm curious because I know um, that you guys must have to look pretty deeply into this, but how do you guys determine, so the, the institutional side is, is pretty simple in understanding the risk aspects. The, the retail lending is, is also pretty simple understanding the risk aspects. How do you guys do a criteria of DeFi projects to see which ones you guys are okay with interacting with and which ones you're not? Yeah, so we, we, we don't play on the fringes. Like uh, all these new projects that you're seeing where, you know, mm -hmm. some, uh, some uh, uh, unknown uh, uh, founder wrote the protocol and uh, you don't know anything about it and it launches and suddenly there's $300 million there. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not us, right? Yeah. So, so first, we will, we will we'll never have more than, I, I think, like a 10% allocation for DeFi. So if you think about six billion in assets, again, we're only talking about uh, less than 10% of that going into DeFi. And even with inside DeFi, we mostly uh, are on platform like uh, Uniswap, Compound, Aave, Bancor, mm. uh, DYDX, and so on. So we are, our job is really to provide liquidity and uh, create yield. Our customers can do it themselves as well, but uh, they just don't want to deal with it, right? They don't want to deal with the keys. They don't want to deal with jumping on the platforms. And again, we deploy 10, 20, $50 million at a time. So my uh, $50 gas fee is distributed over uh, a $50 million transfer, mm -hmm. where uh, if you did it yourself, you put $1,000 in, suddenly $50 is maybe a, a half of your profit. So, so uh, doing it at scale is definitely much more uh, efficient for our community. And when you calculate all those uh, uh, fees and all the time that it would take you, being able to just extract 80% of that without doing anything, without taking care of all the security issues and tax and everything else, is actually a great deal. It's such a good deal. I, I created a company to, to manage my own money for me, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and basically, essentially that's what you guys do what Yearn did, or sorry, Yearn did what you guys do and the fact that tried to pool money so that the fees and all that don't kill people. It's, it's interesting because, so we, sorry, yeah, go ahead. So just to add to that, look, we invented two things. We First, we invented this whole idea that Bitcoin or crypto can yield. Before Celsius, there wasn't anyone that offered you yield. Uh, so that was invention number one. And, and we, we had a lot of skeptics in the beginning. I can tell you that most of the community thought, especially after BitConnect and some of these other things that happened, mm -hmm. people were like, oh my God, not another one. And, and we're like, no, no, we're, we're for real. We're doing it for the community here. We're fully transparent. Come check everything out. Uh, and then we invented a second thing. We said to people, look, you can earn in kind, meaning Bitcoin on Bitcoin or Ethereum on Ethereum. Or if you don't want ETH, you can earn a sell token, which was, again, a year and a half before Compound did Comp, mm. right? So, so both concepts of basically farming or yield 
are, are things that Celsius invented. And and uh, a, and wait, look, I, I'm ecstatic that there are that we have a hundred competitors now, and the industry has fifty billion in total locked up assets. Uh, because doing it, all, if you're the only guy in the street screaming and, and telling everybody you must do this, chances are most people will not believe you. But now that you have 10 competitors, everybody's like, okay, well, which company is the best? Who pays the most? Mm -hmm. Who has the most in assets? Who, who paid the most in interest? Who never got hacked, right? So there we shine because all those things, uh, Celsius looks much better than BlockFi or Nexo or any of the DeFi projects, right? So, so I think uh, we invested a lot of money in, uh, in security in putting the customer first. Uh, and we, we didn't rush to list the project, right? I mean, we, like you guys are the second exchange that we've ever listed on and we're three years old. Most projects, the day they finish the ICO, they run and they list on mm -hmm. this or that exchange and they try to dump on their community. I still have most of my tokens from, from when I got them, uh, what is it, four years ago? Uh, because we feel that, uh, you know, obviously there's still a lot of uh, trap value. And last year, Cell was the best performing token, according to Masari, right? The number one token by far was a Cell token. So, um, so when, you, when you take time to build the community, when you take time to act in the best interest of your users, uh, it pays off for the long term, right? But you have to think long term. Most of these projects, unfortunately, most of the ICOs were projects that were not thinking long term. They were really there to swing and see if it hits. If it doesn't hit, okay, it's going to be a rug pull, mm -hmm. you know? So, or we're going to pivot once or twice and uh, we'll see what happens, you know? So, uh, so to your point, we have not changed the model at all. And um, I'm very proud of the team and, and the community of our ability to kind of really deliver for them what they were looking for, right? They were like, they were looking for a safe place to earn yield. <clears throat> and now everybody's looking for a safe place to earn yield. The entire world is looking for a safe place to earn yield, you know? Yeah, yeah. just, I mean, just to touch on one of those points, and it's a bit off topic, but it's freaking ridiculous what projects raised during the ICO boom. Like with what I know now, if we went back in time, I could have one of these, premier ICOs launched in like two <laughs> weeks, probably like probably two weeks, honestly, it's, it's really wild. I'm, I'm personally a big proponent, Alex, of obviously people interacting with, with crypto themselves and having their own wallets and going and, and, and clicking the buttons for DeFi and seeing how it works. But I do think that there's enormous value and I'm not, and I don't think it's a juxtaposition to put what you guys are building that allows people that would have probably never interacted with it in the first place to have a chance to gain some of the, the benefits that are happening here. So I think kudos to that because anyone that's building things that improve people's lives is very valuable. Now, I agree with you. I mean, look, we, we from the beginning, we said we're not here to convince the not your keys, not your uh, coins guys to come and use Celsius. I mean, we've, our mission statement is 100 million new new people into the blockchain, right? So, and you're right. I mean, 90%, 95% of the population in the world, 7.8 billion people, uh, doesn't even know what keys are. Forget about, uh, they, they, half of the people on the planet are yet to join the internet or have a smartphone. So, so when, when, you know, so really we cannot build uh, the future of finance and make it uh, inclusive only for tech nerds who understand all the stuff and know how to manage their keys. My, my own son, okay, I gave him some coins, he put it on a mute wallet and then he, <laughs> he forgot his, uh, you know, he forgot his password, he can never recover them. So, so and he's, he's savvy, but he just uh, managing, you know, most, most young people think like, what do you mean I lost my password? Just where is the reset password button? It doesn't work this way. So, so my point is, is that we, we need a system that can manage this for 90% of the population. And then maybe there's a 10% of the population that knows how to do it themselves. And, and if we don't do that, your coin and my coin, Bitcoin, Ethereum are not gonna be worth more because the only way our coins are worth more, our bags are worth more, is if we bring all these hundreds of millions of people to come and join us. And if they won't join us without the simplicity of, of uh, it has to look like your Starbucks app where you can just order a coffee 
and it, ha it has to work exactly the same way with that with that kind of interface. So, um, so I think again we're breaking a lot of ground, new ground there in kind of simplifying and automating, uh, right next to people like Coinbase and others who who do I think a great job. Like Coinbase now, they have 50 million accounts now, right? So, mm -hmm. so all that is very important for us as a community to survive because if you don't have enough users. And it doesn't matter how great your technology is. All of us just hanging out together and chilling coins to each other is not going to do anything. Yeah, totally. No, I totally agree on that front. And 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 I I do think though that with time, uh, a lot of us companies that have mostly centralized factors will have to bring considerations in because people, if enough people enter the space just as a natural progression, they'll have more understanding with time and they may want more options. Um, that's my sense. I could be wrong here. I think like, for example, just from the centralized exchange perspective, I think at some point there will have to be more offerings that tie into different DeFi aspects, for example. Um, do, do you feel the same way for, for Celsius? Well, look, for all of the DeFi purists out there, two things. One is uh, read Satoshi's paper. It doesn't say anywhere that only the fully decentralized projects are allowed in and should be uh, uh, promoted or uh, supported. And the second uh, point is that, I'll give you a simple example. If you, if you add liquidity to uh, a Uniswap pair, you add uh, USDC and WBTC, and you, you become a liquidity provider there. Now, so you're using a, fully decentralized platform, you're using smart contract, you're an LP on the platform, but guess what? Both assets are centralized assets. Both USDC and wrapped Bitcoin are centralized assets. So 100% of what you're doing is centralized. So is that decentralized or is that centralized? So my point is, is that, and, and that's by the way, the stable coins and the wrapped Bitcoin are something like 80% of all the volume on all these exchanges on all these uh, DEXs, right? So, so if, you, if you're a purist, if you're a DeFi purist, and you're saying, no, we're only doing decentralized, and you remove all these assets, you're gonna have nothing left, okay? You're gonna, your volume is gonna drop by 80 to 90%. So, so the issue is not, is it centralized or decentralized, right? All the money in the world is still sitting in centralized system, like JP Morgan and Fidelity and BlackRock and so on. And the only way to bring it over is to build bridges between the centralized world and the decentralized world. Because if money cannot flow easily into decentralized uh, platforms, then you didn't create anything. Again, all of us just jumping around in a little puddle called DeFi, right? All of crypto is one trillion. There's hundreds of trillions of dollars worth of just derivatives in the world. So mm -hmm. the financial derivatives. So all I'm saying is, is that for all the DeFi purists, uh, you know, I totally disagree with them. I think uh, it is all about building bridges and it's all about inclusion and it's all about creating safe and simple paths for people to join this revolution because after all, it's for them. It's not for rich people like me, right? We, we don't need this, right? We already, we already made it several times over, but for 7.8 billion people, one tenth of one percent of those people are well off. Everybody else is either in the middle class or struggling to join the middle class or living on, you know, one to ten dollars a day. And and those are the people that need access to this new uh, financial system that is going to be based on the uh, open ledger and public blockchain, right? So, so we it's in our hands. We the community today, our, the technical community, it's in our hands to create inclusion or to create exclusion. And today, too many voices are focused on exclusion as if like we created a private club called DeFi, you know? So come on guys, you know, that's not what we're here for. Grow the pie for everyone. I have, a, I have another question for you, Alex, and this is a pivot from, the, from that line of questioning, but so you've built things that are traditional startups in most senses of the word. And now you're building something within crypto that's gotten quite big, really big. I would love to hear a little bit of your thoughts on the differences of starting a startup and 
regular tech world versus the cryptocurrency world? Have you had any large differences there or is it pretty similar? No, it's it's very different. I think uh, when you're building a, a tech startup, uh, yes, you're fighting for adoption and yes, you are trying to focus on your customers, but really the, like the core uh, uh, people that make decisions in the company are your shareholders, meaning your investors, and you as a founder, right? That's the relationship. You know, you have a board meeting, you pitch them on your ideas. They either agree with you or not. They either fund you, give you additional rounds of funding, or if they disagree with you, they usually replace you as a, as a CEO, right? They bring somebody else who will get them to an exit because most venture guys just focused on an exit. They're, they're in it just for the exit. Right, and crypto is very different. I mean, if you look at even uh, most of the DeFi projects or most of the kind of successful exchanges that have been launched, and uh, there is much more of a, of a of a cause. Right, people are building it because they believe in something. Uh, they want to create something different than Wall Street or than uh, the financial banking system that we're all familiar with, and and uh, you know. Those are, those are drivers that, that are very, very different. This, the decisions you make when you try to do these things are very, very different than the decisions you make when you just try to optimize or maximize shareholder value. So at Celsius, our statement is uh, do good and then do well, right? That's what we, our mantra of the company is. And, and we, we ask ourselves every day, what else can we do for our customers? How can we improve their lives? How can we can make it easier for them? How can we earn more for them? And by focusing on that, which is the opposite of what most investors will tell you you need to do. I mean, again, in, in 700 years of banking, there has never been an institution, not once, an institution that paid 80% of its income to its depositors, right? Every financial institution on the planet today and in the last 700 years, paid 80% or more of its income to its shareholders and to its mm. management team, never to its depositors. That's why we're earning nothing. Again, look, just a few days ago, Jamie Dimon proudly announced that he made $12.1 billion in one quarter. That's the profit, not the revenues, the profit. So mm. that's he can give $2 to every person on the planet, right? But he chooses to give all that money as, as a dividend and a stock buyback to his shareholders. He can raise your rates, he can pay you 5% on your money, but he doesn't have to because you and me are giving our money to Chase Bank uh, for free, right? In some countries you have to pay to deposit the money. In Switzerland, Germany, the rates are negative. They're, they charge you money to deposit your money in the bank. Mm -hmm. Now that is lunacy, right? So, so we lowered, we the people, have lowered our standards so much that we accept the fact that somebody charges us our hard-earned money, somebody charges us to deposit it and keep it safe, right? That's, that's just, and, and make $12 billion on it afterwards, right? Yeah. So th when you think about it, when you just disconnect, right, and bank yourself, and you think about it from a completely different point of view, you go, wait a second, that is just lunacy, that's crazy. But the problem is there's no alternative. It's not like you say, well, JP Morgan is crazy, so I'm gonna go across the street and deposit it over there and they're gonna pay me five, six or 9%, right? The guy across the street does exactly the same thing. So, so when we created Celsius, we did something that everybody thought was lunacy, which was to give 80% of that income to your depositors. Now, it happens that I'm giving it back to myself because I'm the largest user of Celsius. So I'm benefiting from it, right? So it mm -hmm. was an easy decision, but. My point is, is that now there's an, you know, an army of people that are saying, me too, me too, I'll sit next to you. Come on, I'll, here are my coins. And, and, and so we really created a movement, right? And people are very passionate about it because their eyes are open now and they realize for how many years these banks and financial institutions have been taking advantage of them. So, so that's really what's so special here, right? Is that, that we're taking on the largest banks in the world, the largest financial firms in the world. And most people, when I started Celsius, looked at me and said, Alex, come on. Yeah, you won a few battles against the phone companies with voice of IP, but this, these are the banks. I mean, this, they're gonna take you out. Do you mm -hmm. have a bodyguard? You know, mm -hmm. that, that, th these are the conversation I had 
with my friends and, and early users of Celsius. So, so it, it's, it's, you know, this is, this is hundreds of billions of dollars that are at stake around the world uh, because, uh, again, this is the, you know, banks make crazy amount of money. They just don't give it to us, right? They keep it all to themselves. Banks, banks are not your friends. Let's put it that way, you know? Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree. And no matter how outlandish it's becoming in some sense, and this sounds weird, but I'm grateful for them being so bad in their understanding of where things are moving because it's giving the chance for us in our industry to surge forward. It's really, really setting a framework up that makes sense for all these things that we're building or we're interacting with right now. Because like, you know, if, if Chase did offer 5%, I don't think many people would care to go and look for eight or 10% or anything else like that. They're like, whatever, I'm happy. But the fact that soon they'll maybe have negative rates is that's what's driving people to us. And that's what's driving Bitcoin's price up. I mean, they're shifting the macro narrative in a way that benefits all of this community. So have to say I'm grateful for these bankers for not having the correct foresight to see that their industry is dying. <laughs> well, you're right. You're right. Uh, they gave us 12 years start a head start. And, 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 and it's ridiculous. I mean, it's ridiculous that JP Morgan finally recommended Bitcoin at 40,000, right? They wouldn't recommend it at 5,000 or 10,000 or even 20,000. They waited until it went up to 40,000. And then they said, it's going to 163,000, you know? Mm -hmm. And of course, the next day it started crashing, you know, the second they said that. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, but we, we're, look, our job is to deliver for the community, right? That's really our job. And if we don't deliver for them, we're not going to deliver for ourselves. Yeah, I mean, and we're seeing the power of these communities. Have you been following this GameStop Wall Street bets situation? Yeah, crazy. Yeah. These communities on the internet are having the power to take on some of the largest hedge funds in the world. It's like, I... I Love it from the perspective that we're seeing what the internet can bring together for good, for good, for bad, doesn't matter, but it has this cohesive element that can bring so many people that one-on-one -on -one against any of these institutions would have no chance, but here they are bankrupting huge hedge funds because they have conviction on what they're doing. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's the same thing with us. Like, look, any of us going to knocking on the door of our branch bank and saying, hey, I know you guys made uh, billions of dollars, raise my interest rate, right? And not, they would laugh at you and shut down your account and kick you out of the branch, right? But if a million of us got together or 10 million or 100 million of us got together and suddenly we collected all these assets, uh, we can get whatever we want, right? I mean, we can get them to do whatever we want. So, so we're seeing it already. We're seeing one bank after the next kind of change their posture and start to accept a stable coin. And now they're fine with crypto and they're running to the OCC and begging to be allowed to do the same thing and mm -hmm. get licenses and whatever. So, so we are, the, there's definitely cracks in the wall. And I think uh, this new administration that just started in Washington is definitely, I think, going to listen very carefully to what this community wants to do. And Sam, you know, your, your boss at FTX, I think is officially uh, Biden's largest single contributor. So we're betting on him to keep helping us <laughs> with uh, making sure that we can whisper in his ear if we ever get in trouble. So, so um, you know, so all of that put together, you, you just look, we, we just want a seat at the table, right? Mm -hmm. We, we want to be, we want to make our case and, and the, uh, the regulators, the, the lawmakers, need to listen carefully and see if we're really acting in the best interest of the people. Yes, there are going to be some people who get hurt, the bankers and some of their shareholders and these hedge funds you're talking about. But the vast majority of us are going to benefit from this, right? Shifting the power from the banks to decentralized, uh, uh, you know, open ledger, uh, blockchain-based systems. That's the future. So do we want to own the future? The future is here. Do we want to own it or do we want to let it go? Do we want someone else like China to dominate it? And, mm -hmm. and, and to grab the future, you have to leave the past behind. And that's where we're struggling. We're struggling, the lawmakers, 
and like the previous SEC commissioner and all these other people, they're struggling to leave the past behind. Well, you guys are being used for uh, malicious activities. Bitcoin is being, you're kidding me? Look like at cash. last yeah. year, last year, all the banks in the world got over $100 billion in fines for malicious activity. I mean, what are you talking about? Yeah. We're, we don't even have that in market cap, most of us. So, <laughs> so like every dollar that you touch already got used over the last, I don't know, hundred years got used for, for some illicit activity, every dollar in the world, you know? So, so it's just completely ridiculous to, to, to say those things, but, but here we are, you know, we, we have to prove beyond any doubt that what we're doing is, is in the, uh, society's best interest and it's not easy to do because again the history of this community is again anarchist and uh, cyberpunks and and uh, and all that stuff right so so we have to graduate from that and having uh, people like Michael Saylor and and other people kind of be kind of the new ambassadors for for crypto is definitely a huge improvement or a huge upgrade from uh, the, the guys that we used to have, like uh, McAfee and others who were basically <laughs> not really helping us yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. make the case that we are here to make society better. Mm -hmm. No, I, yeah, I absolutely agree. And, and, and we're seeing this shift quite quickly. And I think 2021 will be the shelling point for us seeing quite a shift from being a niche industry, even though that we've had tons of growth, I'd still definitely say we're a niche industry that most people don't understand. I can see us coming onto the scene in a way where people will embrace cryptocurrencies, blockchain, DeFi in a much wholer sense. I mean, these are this is a, a bad example, but if there is this TV show in the United States that has millions of users and there are millions of viewers and they had a they had a DeFi question on it. I don't know what I don't remember what it's called. It's one of these Wheel of Fortune game shows or whatever. And there was a DeFi question in it. So it's like enough of these little things accumulate together, and we'll have a shelling point, and the banks will be done. I I used to want to be a banker, Alex. I thought you know I studied finance and international business, and I thought that banking was the cool thing, and I wanted to be an investment banker. And then I read this book called The House of Morgan which is the biography of the Morgan family. And yeah. I realized banking is on the out and out and we're in the in and in. So just got to keep building. <laughs> well, yeah. you, you were saved from the, from the abyss, you know, like uh, uh, I think there's a line like this in, uh, in the, uh, Wall Street, you know, the movie Wall Street, where it says you look at the abyss and the abyss stares you back at your back and you have to decide if you have a backbone or not. So you found your backbone. So kudos to you. <laughs> um, Alex, my, so my last line of questioning for you is the future for Celsius Network. What are you guys looking at right now? What are some of the things you're working on, some of the things you're excited about? Yeah, so look, we're, we're just at the beginning of the, of the road here, right? So uh, we have 45 assets. I think we're going to be growing to several hundred different assets. And like I said, we've added three or four different tokenized gold products like Pax Gold and, and uh, um, uh, DGLD and, and the Tether Gold and so on. So we think that even though a lot of people in the crypto community may not see that as a very exciting product, people look at us like, what? Why are you bringing gold into crypto? You know, but, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, gold is a $10 trillion market cap. So if you can bring any of those people across Again, build a bridge and bring all that capital into crypto. We all benefit. That is more traffic on Ethereum. That is helping uh, 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 ETH2 and so on, so on, right? Because we, these are all building blocks uh, to scale what we're doing. So, so we're focused on uh, basically uh, pushing the envelope or pushing this in all directions to grow the assets, to grow the yield that we can generate. Uh, uh, lower the rates that we charge people. So we charge 1%. If you want to take a margin loan uh, against the, your Bitcoin or Ethereum and, mm -hmm. and defer your taxes, you'll pay 1% per year, right? Just like the very, very rich, just like the 1% uh, of the population that, that can go to any bank and borrow at 1%. Mm -hmm. Now you can borrow on crypto at 1%, right? So that's, 
And that's an equalizer. Even if you need $500, it will cost you 1% per year, right? So, so those are the things that, that uh, uh, this industry has an opportunity to completely change, right? Just like Voice of IP did. Anyone can communicate with anyone basically for free, right? So, so it used to be that only the rich people could pick up the phone and call England or call Germany or call uh, uh, Japan because it was $3 a minute to use AT&T to call overseas. So, so we, are, we, we are pushing against all these norms uh, of fees, right? We don't charge any fees. We just basically keep 20% of what we make for our users. And we set that as a standard, right? So now anyone who's coming into this industry, they can't come in and pay 50% and charge fees. They have to do better than us. They have to pay mm -hmm. less. They have to charge less than Celsius in fees, which is zero. That's hard to do. And they have to pay more than 80% uh, 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 to the community, right? Because the community is already expecting that. Also, we're doing a lot of work on uh, transparency. So we've added, like, for example, recently we've done an audit with chain analysis to do an asset validation. Um, uh, we are doing a partnership with the Horizon uh, blockchain with Zen to... Uh, basically write all of our transactions into the blockchain so anyone can do the equivalent of an Ether scan and, and verify that we actually earned this yield and that it was paid to the community and that, that mm -hmm. everyone who's sitting next to me on the bus got their pro rata, right? Did Alex take more for himself or did he give all of us what we deserve, right? Stuff like that. So, so these are all things that set a new standard, a higher bar, a real-time audit, right? That's one of the functions of a distributed ledger that anyone can audit anyone in real time. Well, believe me, none of the banks want that to happen, right? I mean, none of these, in 2008, when during the collapse, no one knew who owned what. I mean, the reason <laughs> yeah. the Fed had to bail everybody out is because all the derivatives and all the real estate and all that stuff got to be so complicated that the Fed realized, gosh, if we don't bail out everybody, this will be, we'll be in courts forever and we're gonna have a depression around us. So with, with the blockchain, we, we don't want to take the worst lessons from Wall Street and bring them into the blockchain. We want to create a new environment that acts in our best interest. We're building it for ourselves. We're building it for our children. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's where the challenge, that's where I really get mad when I see all these guys bragging, oh, you know, this and that exchange, I made a billion dollars on all my customers. And I see, well, then you're not any better than Wall Street. What'd you do? You took the worst examples from there and you brought them into crypto. So DeFi is much closer to this utopia that I'm talking about, but DeFi has other problems. Like we think we have governance control, but we don't. When we try to do governance votes on a bunch of projects, guess what happened? <laughs> you know, uh, they didn't happen, right? Like on yeah. Compound and a few other projects where basically even though uh, the, the community said we want this and that, those votes and those decisions have not been made, uh, uh, you know, didn't pass basically. So, so, so we, we really need to work on governance. We need to work on uh, building bridges. We need to work on scalability and, and, uh, and the stills, too many rock pools, too many uh, incidents of, of hacking and funds being stolen. Uh, we got to improve the insurance stuff. Or how do we, ensure the collective right to make sure that people can trust the platforms mm -hmm. and and know that their their, their money is not going to disappear and, and make it simpler right it's still way complicated like you want to be a farmer it's easier to go and buy a tractor and actually get a field and, and farm it than it is to do it on DeFi. i mean man you got to know so many things you know so so a lot to do look this yeah. is and and again some of the best minds in the world have quit companies like Google and Microsoft and and Uber and whatever and came to work at crypto. Mm -hmm. So so it's yeah. definitely top talent and young, exciting people to work with. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we're moving faster than pretty much any industry out there right now, which is a huge blessing. It, it's this iterative uh, experimentation where everybody's borrowing everybody's ideas and making it better and better and better. And again, I, I, the only thing I'm worried about is regulators, right? I think the regulators are seeing the speed, like you said, the speed mm -hmm. at which we're moving. And they're like, gosh, 
this is a uh, this train is gonna definitely crash. We gotta mm -hmm. slow it down. We gotta stop it. You know, like who's driving this thing? Oh, it's decentralized. Oh my God, no one <laughs> is in charge. <laughs> yeah. So that's how Washington views us. When they look at us, they think we're all crazy and we, we're all criminals and we're all running around stealing each other's money. Uh, and, and really, we're building the future of finance, and they're all eventually going to come and use us and thank us for it. But uh, right now, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, uh, you have to prove that you're not a criminal still. Yeah, I totally agree. And anytime anyone brings this up with me, Alex, the parallel I use were how all the HSBC banks in Mexico increased their window sizing for the drive through banking so the cartels could throw the big duffel bags through. And I'm like, <laughs> come on, give me a break that we're here to finance crime and whatnot, you know? So crazy, yeah, just gotta crazy, keep at right? it. I mean, yes. Well, thank and they you. They call us criminals, you know? Yeah, they, exactly. But that's the thing, I think, just have to keep building, showing legitimacy, showing transparency, and showing that it's here to make people's lives better in some way or another. Well, and look, you, you know, you guys at FTX are doing a great job, I think, uh, making it uh, cheaper and faster and better for, for people to, uh, uh, to come on board and transact and learn about the, how to work with centralized and decentralized platforms. So definitely, uh, you know, uh, like I met Sam several times and it's amazing. Like he, again, he came from the outside. He came from the dark side, right? He was running... Uh, working in a hedge fund on Wall Street and, and uh, definitely built one of the best platforms in crypto and, you know, very, obviously very active uh, on, on DeFi and so on. So mm -hmm. all these things are, that's what you want. You want to attract talent like this that takes all of us into, uh, you know, uh, new directions and, and improves, on the, improves on our development of the capabilities of the community. Yep. You hear that, listeners? Anyone that's wondering if they should come in the industry will welcome you with open arms. Well, Alex... Yeah, and we're all hiring. I know you guys are hiring. We're hiring mm -hmm. all over the world. So no matter where you are, we, we're always looking for talent and definitely uh, reach out to us. We're, we're always looking for uh, great, great young minds. All right. Well, you heard it here on the FTX podcast, folks. Thanks for coming on, Alex. I appreciate your time, man. Thanks for having me.